obviously the main point of this program today is to listen to former employees at the Sunflower Plant come up here and share some of their stories. Before that, I'm going to give maybe a three or four minute overview of the history of the plant and then kind of set up the format for how we'd like to do our program tonight. Um, so the Sunflower Plant, of course, had a profound impact on the history of the Eudora area. Eudora was founded in 1857 by German immigrants. By 1940, the overwhelming majority of Eudora area residents were still German immigrants and or their descendants. In 1940, just before the plant opened, Eudora had a population of 713. Obviously, all that changed December of 1941. The United States found itself at war with Japan, Italy, and Germany. So there was a profound need for munitions and propellants and powders, and it was decided that they would build a powder plant here in Northeast Kansas. They obviously decided on the place just a few miles east of here. One of the consequences of this was that it leveled the former town of Prairie Center, which we still consider part of the Eudora area. Construction on the plant began 80 years ago in 1942. The Sunflower plant opened in 1943 and it was operated by Hercules Powder. It employed 12,000 people during World War II. It was the largest smokeless powder plant in the world. During World War II, the Sunflower plant produced more than 200 million pounds of propellants, uh, which were used to help the Allies win World War II. The powder and propellants made at the Sunflower plant um, were shipped all over Europe and the Pacific. The population of Eudora tripled after the opening of the plant. Many of the plant's workers and their families moved to Eudora. As a result, the Eudora area faced an extreme housing shortage between 1942 and 1945. The sunflower plant workers and their families that moved to Eudora lived in whatever shelter they could find. Some workers and their families lived in garages, chicken coops, basements, and tents. Uh, Eudora's resources were stretched to their limits in the early 1940s. However, the city of Eudora and the Eudora area residents quickly adapted to the influx of people and many of those people that moved to Eudora stayed there permanently. After World War II, the sunflower plant went into standby and typically became operational during subsequent U.S. conflicts, i.e. Korea and Vietnam. Production at the sunflower plant ceased permanently in 1992. Uh, since 1992, there's been a cleanup effort at the plant, and just a few days ago it was announced that Panasonic is going to redevelop the site, which could create up to 4,000 jobs. Uh, in 2012, we at the Historical Society were invited out to the former plant, and we were given many artifacts and archives from the plant's history, which we now display and keep on file in our museum. So if anyone is interested in accessing those or researching appeals, please feel free to do so. Uh, just so I have an idea, how many people plan to come up here and, and speak tonight about their experiences at the plant? I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that a lot of people will because the, the point of this program is to document these stories for posterity. These uh, stories are, are history and they need to be preserved for all time. So if you're here and if you worked at the plant, I will uh, kindly ask that you do please come up here and share some stories with us because it's very important. Um, I think uh, most speakers will probably limit it to five to ten minutes and I think um, you can go ahead and ask questions of the speaker when they're still up here after they finish speaking. That way people don't go sit down and then you have to wait till the end to answer, to ask questions and get them answered. So I would, uh, I would encourage you to ask the speakers up here questions if you have any while they're still up here. And we have some photos and other artifacts up here on display and certainly if anyone brought any more you could put them up there and you could um, also show the people here. Um, I will ask that the people that come up here please stand at the podium, that way you're, you're on camera and you'll be filmed for uh, our online audience and also for our archives because this will obviously become a historical document after the program. Um, so yeah, just come up here, please introduce yourself, tell us when you worked at the plant, and then please tell us some stories so we get a better idea of the sunflower plant because the plant did close over 30 years ago, so a lot of younger people probably don't know much about the plant. So I think it's important for us to, to tell some of those stories tonight. That's all I have. Uh, our first speaker is Jim Turrentine.
My name is Jim Turrentine. I was the government engineer at Sunflower for 26 years. I was there between 1947, 1974, and 2000. When I was at the when I was at the plant, and you saw me in the administration area, I was the one that walked around with a tie on and whatever. But most of the time, I tried to spend my time out into the plant. And I wore a hard hat, safety glasses, coveralls, nice yellow coveralls, and safety shoes. And of course, they didn't allow beards. We had masks in order to put on in case there was a difficulty with the air itself. So none of us wore masks or wore beards. I was brought into the government as the technical person on the government. So I followed all the technical issues with the operation and operation of the plant and the people there. I have a whole list of things to tell you that I actually did at the plant. I monitored the modernization and the construction of new facilities at Sunflower Army Ammunition Plant. I reviewed the drawings, technical documents, and the revisions before they were approved. I received, reviewed written procedures for maintenance, operation, on everything that anybody did at the plant. Over 26 years, I inspected almost every one of the 2,000 buildings that were at the plant. I drove the 119 miles of road sometime over those 26 years. I walked miles of the 64 miles of railroad. Not all, though. <laughs> I monitored the many aspects for the production of items that could produce, be produced at Sunflower Army Ammunition Plant. I inspected every many aspects of the production for items that could be produced at the plant. It was my job to know what was good they could do and how to do it. I inspected every piece of equipment that was cleaned before shutdown in the area. Chuck and initial that I have my initials on thousands and thousands of pieces of equipment before they disposed of them. And now they're probably all gone. <laughs> so nobody will know that I was ever there. <laughs> I briefed, I briefed generals, executives, VIPs, on the history and operation of the plant, more time than I can count over the years. I have on my, I have on my phone a recording of one of the 10 minute speeches I gave for the history of the plant. I'm not gonna give this speech because the history of the plant, even the condensed version has all kinds of technical words and data, and we had names for the facilities. And if I was to have to stand up here and explain all that, there wouldn't be enough hours in the evening, two hours, to tell you what all these words meant. 
and what and they involve. So I'll leave that for you all to come up and tell your stories. those speeches. <laughs> those speeches. Those speeches had all kinds of charts and graphs and I had a map that was as big as a wall on the in the conference room and I would point to things and explain it to them and I would depending on what the people were coming in for that was my job to inform them of what had gone on there, what was going on at the time they came, and what needed to be done. And I all worked with you all that worked out there in order to do that. I was the person who inspected the most dangerous buildings in preparation for destruction. The buildings, the buildings on my shirt, this building, was the most dangerous building in the plant. Remember. Jeff can tell you. He can tell you all the details. <coughs> I was there when it exploded. I remember the blast wave coming over my ear. that created this big fireball. And as a result of that, we went to work and we wrote and created procedures or the contractor did. Nitroglycerin was the material that blew up in that plant. And I'll leave Chuck to tell you about that if he wants. But I was the one that reviewed procedures that safely destroyed all the dangerous buildings at Sunflower. And I stayed there till 2000 in order to make sure that all the dangerous buildings were destroyed and safe. They were safe and nobody would get hurt before I retired. I monitored the program for the physical and environmental clean disposal. Next subject. Nitroguanidine was what was made when I was there. I monitored the technical aspects of the production of nitroguanidine. I'll just tell you one little thing about it. Nitroguanidine is the third major ingredient in cannon propellant. Now to the most important things. I spent 26 years talking to anybody and everybody at the Sunflower Ammunition Plant. I interacted with people doing their work. I unexpected and accepted with the workers that did the work. I had relationships with our supervisors and those who were in charge.
I participated in worker training classes, not to learn how to do things, but to understand that the procedures I reviewed and recommended for approval really worked. I attended meetings with the supervisors they had with their employees. I had individual talks. One-on-one -on -one with people at all levels of the plant. I traveled with contractor personnel all over the country. Maybe some of you can tell about those things. I even went to Europe with them. I was involved in the environmental operations of the plant. I was the government representative at meetings in Topeka with contractor personnel and environmental office officials from the state of Kansas. I was the person who hung out the door of the helicopter and I took the pictures of the environmental sensitive areas of the plant. I worked with Corps of Engineers and contractors to design and build wastewater treatment. Just before I retired, I worked on plans for the environmental restoration of the plant. I do not know if any of these plans were implemented. I see someone in the back row that might. I hope he comes up and talks. But the most important thing, I want to thank all those who are here and all those who work with me and all those watching us on Facebook who work there. Or even the ones that watch us later on YouTube. We made Sunflower a better place. We contribute to making the world a better place. And I'm going to leave the stories, Sunflower stories, for other, you others to come up. And I will urge you to do that today so that we can understand what I understood about how Sunflower operated and what we did there and how important it was to everybody. May I answer any questions? Of the 9,000 acres, how much of that is actually contaminated and why? Actually, very few of the acreage is contaminated. Most of the area of the plant is what we call quantity distance for quantity distance. We place the buildings with space between them so that if one building blew up, they wouldn't hurt the adjacent buildings they wouldn't kill people in the adjacent buildings. And hopefully, the way it was built, they wouldn't hurt or kill the people that were working there. So, so if there's a small area there, like one area I recommended, they, we used um, fertilizer. I, uh, Ammonia nitrate. Well, during the production, 
We had an incident where one of the tanks overflowed and we got some fertilizer on the ground. You know, people put fertilizer on the ground, farmers all over the world. They don't consider that a contaminant, but the state of Kansas does. But I recommend that, that if they just planted poplar trees, when I retired, those trees would have sucked all that ammonia nitrate up into the, all those trees, and none of that area that was contaminated with ammonia nitrate. It would be absolutely clean by now. That was 22 years ago. And I have no idea if that was done. I don't see any popular trees in the aerial photographs. But I did two years ago when I went out there. I saw them bringing out truckloads of stuff of dirt and stuff to go to death involved landfill or whatever. And I said, I said to myself, why, why are these people spending that kind of money if they would have implemented some of my cleanup methods? And there were other areas of the plant. The person in the back row knows about those that he knew where they were. And that area was dug up, was decontaminated, and he can tell you the methods they used. The methods, some of the methods were the ones that we just used to, to, to get away from, to destroy all the buildings that were dangerous to people. You can take an explosive, and essentially what we did out there is we took explosives and we modified them so they weren't explosives, so that they only burnt. Because what we wanted was propellant that burnt, did not explode. So if you pick up those pieces of stuff and treat it properly, they should all be gone by now. Well, that's my personal opinion. The implementation of things like that is harder than the uh, other facts. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, bring her on up real quick and let's let her do her story real fast. <laughs> if you if you just want to step aside, we'll just make sure there's no more questions real quick. That's fine. I'm, I'm, an old, I'm a retired teacher. I've got a very loud voice. So, thank you. Hi, I'm, my name is Sue Lewis, and I worked at the ammunition plant for an entire summer from May through September in 1967. That was the months before I got married. And of course, Sunflower paid huge money, and I could make a lot of money in a short period of time, unlike clerking or some others. Uh, and, and as I recall, we got paid $3 on uh, days, and three fifteen dollars on the swing, and three twenty-five dollars on the night shift. And we all did shift work. We'd have one shift for five days, and then you had two days off. And then you did another shift, different. So everybody worked the same shift. And uh, I, I had a thoroughly wonderful experience. The people I worked with, what surprised me mostly when I first came was there were people who were on their third tour at Sunflower. They had been here in World War II making powder. They were here in Korea making propellants, powders, and shells, I think. And then for Vietnam, which was my gig, we made Mighty Bass rocket fuel. And it was about, it was a, it, it looked like a bright orange, like this woman's shirt. But it was a bright orange and it felt kind of like 
anybody who works there, you know. And it felt kind of like a, a heavy-duty rubber. What was it? Plastic clay. Yeah, a kind of, a, but but it wasn't real hard. And the, each piece was what four feet. About that. Had to be sawed to the exact amount. And then they put these connectors on each end. <coughs> and I worked, my first job was to work in a saw house. And they sawed the pieces. They were long pieces and they had a star-shaped cylinder through the middle. And I worked in a little room. I sat on a stool and I had a window right here. And they sawed it to that exact amount and it had to be precise. And all the little shavings and stuff like that ended up down and they would you'd have to gently sweep those out of the way i had that job one time too and you're pushing that thinking hmm is this a good idea and this did not explode this was not explosive stuff this went whoosh with fire that's what we did. and we had two houses when i was there that summer one did that when we were in it a saw house and uh, my job was to look and those pieces would come from where they were sawed in one room and they pushed them through on a roller and they stopped in this little room and my job was to look at them and make sure they weren't spinning if they started to spin then i hit the get out of here button and everybody in the place ran and got out of there so i thought that was kind of a demanding job <laughs> 19 year old but I you know and and I got a little a few times I'd had to do this to wake up because you're standing there looking at that and you're thinking eh, is that starting to move or is that solid or whatever so uh, and we did have one that started and when that started then we all had to scatter and the buildings there were several buildings all over and the buildings had like garage door walls the, the walls went up and this was in the summertime and it was hot and we were all in our coveralls that came to here then I had a helmet, not a helmet, uh, it was like a, a scarf, what did they call it? It was hood. a hood, there hood. you go, and that came down like this and covered and I had to, I had, that, that was all provided, I had to buy my own steel toed shoes and uh, that helped that hood fit like this and then we had gloves and it could get kind of warm in that outfit and we came in and went into this change house put that gear on and then we loaded up to get on a bus to take you to whichever station whichever house you were in and I we just lined up and, and followed the person in front of you and then they'd say you over here and okay so you went off with them into a special room where you they patted you down and, and searched you and they were looking for anything that was flammable a lighter or matches or something like that interestingly enough at least back then when they were talking about it the people who got caught the most were not smokers but were people who went out remember when you could burn your trash in the in the alley and these were people who'd go out to burn the trash and put it in their pocket and just forget all about it. Uh, I was a smoker at the time, as was pra practically everybody in 67. Um, and they had a special house way away from everything. And you walk this rock path into that little house, anyone who was smoking, and there were benches. You sat on those benches, and they had electric lighters on the wall. So the smokers didn't were didn't bring their own lighters. You didn't need to. And that's where we had special occasion parties was in the smokehouse because the radiators, they'd crank those up and you could keep any kind of food really hot and nice. <laughs> we'd set them on there and then that's where we'd go to, to have a hot meal. And we had wonderful people who brought wonderful food from all over. And I remember that very distinctly. I remember the people who were so kind to me, and I was one of the younger people at the time, uh, and they teased me unmercifully about getting married, and uh, they had this big surprise party for me when I left, 
and that's, that's something that has stayed with me all my life, the kindness of everyone. People that you didn't know, and, and I was this young kid who was just trying to make some money before I got married. And the other thing were the powder headaches. I was prone to headaches anyway. I used to get migraines a lot, and you'd get what they call the powder headache from the chemicals. What? Nitroglycerin. And go into the, uh, you know, the nurse, and I don't, I don't know, I don't even care what it was they gave me, but it got rid of the headache. So, so I was okay with it. And uh, it, it was a really good experience. And Vietnam was so controversial for everyone that it was kind of nice to feel like you were contributing and that you were part of something that maybe was going to be good. Uh, so, you know, if you had three things, it would be those people who were on their third tour at Sunflower, three wars they had been in, which is kind of sad, you know. And uh, uh, that, and I will tell one little thing, and it was that they, um, I had a friend that I rode back and forth with from Lawrence, and he wadded up and took some of that propellant, mm. which you, you know, he, and he didn't get caught. It was awful. You shouldn't do that. Mm. So, but he did. And he took it and was going to use it for the 4th of July. <laughs> and he put it in the, his backyard and slid it. And his parents weren't home. And it went whoosh. Fire, the whole backyard, burnt the whole backyard, <laughs> and bubbled the siding on the back of the house. And I laughed about that, we laughed about that, and I said, oh my, Alan, how did you get a, you know, what did your folks say? He wouldn't even talk about it. So. <laughs> anyway, those were my experiences, and I had no, nothing good, uh, nothing bad, but just good memories of that experience. So, that's, that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> Oh, Sue Lewis was it was my name, and as I said, I made a huge. I made a thousand dollars that summer, which was huge money, huge money. I think we have a quick question over here to the left, and then we'll yeah. uh -huh. keep going. Did you have a question? No, I don't have a question. Okay. Are you next up? Uh, I work uh, two times out here. Korea and then the Vietnam War. So you you were two time. I were two time. Two time. And uh, <laughs> I'd like to just briefly talk because I've got to fly up to Bray and I can't stay very here. Okay, okay, come on up. And if anybody had any more questions for Jim, if you just want to catch him afterwards, and I'm sure he'd be glad to answer those. I got one here. I'd like to find out just how many uh, people worked out there in, right after the same time you did back in uh, 67. Because uh, I, I worked out there and I was probably newer. Uh, we probably were on the bus together. I drove the bus. Uh, <laughs> 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 so you knew everybody. Is that right? And what's your name, sir? My name is Gary Skeet. Okay, Gary Skeet, guys. I uh, work. First, uh, right out of high school, I was uh, over at my girlfriend's house, and uh, his grandfather was a line foreman in the maintenance garage. And he said, what are you doing? And I said, oh, I'm looking for a job. Oh, I said, I think I can find one for you. He said, if you work at a garage, he said, that you'll understand like that. He says, uh, I'm looking for a painter's helper. He said, we're going to open a second shift. And I said, well, yeah, I'm looking, you yeah, know, sure. So I jumped on it, and uh, that's how I started out here, as a painter's helper in the garage. <laughs> well, basically, what I wanted to tell you there was, it was a quite a thrill for a farmer boy to all of a sudden come out into this big world and meet all kinds of people from all over, different kinds of people. And it was an experience that was very interesting. But that wasn't the big story. I worked two years before I closed that time. And then 
I got a chance to come back in 65. Yeah, November of 65 and really hit the jackpot. They said, ah, I see that you are a police officer. You've got a, a clearance. You can work for us and do a, 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 a carry, carrying uh, paper, uh, security papers and everything like that. He said, how would you like to drive in the order pool and be an off-plant driver? Yeah, I can do that. <laughs> so the deal is, my job as an all-plant driver was to go all over the Kansas City area. And I mean way on east, clear out on the Let's see, where, what? Gray Valley. Gray Valley and stuff, yeah, and beyond. Then also clear up above uh, uh, Leverburg. And as far as down to Wichita, it was an experience. And the thing was, I drive my regular uh, eight to four ship. And then, of course, if the maintenance had a problem, like in the water system, they had people working late. And that means, hey, you want to hang over and get some overtime? <laughs> 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 and then I drive people, get a sedan, and then I drive all over that. The biggest night I ever had was they had a big problem down in the water system. I'd just come in from my eight-hour shift, and he said, you won't work overtime, yeah. I said, we're going to need you just a little bit, hang on. I got a whole load of people in and go way down south and unloaded them. Come back, he said, you won't hang on a little longer? He said, we got some people that got to go north. Yeah, sure, I'll do it. Got in the car and came way on up, clear up. To Leavenworth and all around in there. Come back. And it's two o'clock in the morning. I call it on the radio on the forum where I'm at. The dispatcher says, You just go and take the car home. He said, When you get around and wake up in the morning, come on back in. You can do your job over. <laughs> <laughs> So that was my biggest day, but I did that many, many times. I also drove the bomb buggy. I, you know, I did almost anything and everything, and it was, how do you say, a big thrill. And here is a picture of the motor pool. It was from in, in 1966 to 72 when it finally closed down for me and I left. But it was a thrill, it was a great experience, and of course we all know it was good money. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. I've got one more for you. Has anybody ever heard the name Wester House? <laughs> I do that. In the picture right here, is a fellow that is dressed with a white shirt and khaki pants and was that way every day, immaculate. Nicest man I think I ever met. There was a joke that went around that was a truism. When Carl took his two weeks off, he did his farming here in Eudora area. When he came back to work, the first thing they said is, Hey, Carl, did you wax your tractor and your combine again? And he'd say, you damn right I did. <laughs> he was immaculate in every way. The nicest guy I ever met among a lot of nice Eudora people. Thank you very much. Want to give the mic? <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. You bet, thank you. All right, whoever wants to come up next and speak. All right, go ahead. Hey, you walker.
Oh, you don't need it. I could, I could use it. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. My name is Daryl Zimmerman, and I live in DeSoto, Kansas. And I'll be. Yeah, I think you'll need, you'll need to use the mic. You think, think so? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Is it, is it on? Yeah, it's on. Okay. Okay, can you hear me now? I figured I, figured I was going to use a school teacher voice that I, I did. But. Okay, well, when you think about Central Liar Ordinance Plant today, probably you picture, the first thing you picture in your mind is the four water towers. And over here is a, a piece of redwood that was part of the water towers when they were first constructed. The sunflower tower, towers were originally built of redwood staves with galvanized tension hoops around them. And the present towers are on the same uh, legs and a steel floor with welded steel tanks. The redwood was old growth, at least 50 years uh, representing in this particular piece I've got over here. It looks like a book with a piece of paper in front of it. Uh, the white coating on it is calcium deposits from the hard well water uh, to, uh, that uh, came from the Kansas River floodplain. Uh, I've got more story here than just about sunflower, and as a result, I know good speakers are supposed to engage the audience by looking at them. But I'm going to look down and read as fast as I can because it does involve other things. Japan made a surprise attack on the United States battleship in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii on December the 7th, 1941. Franklin Roosevelt and the U.S. Congress declared war the next day. I was the only child of Frankie and Edward Zimmerman of DeSoto, Kansas. And I was born September the 21st, 1936. I entered the first grade at Cedar Junction, a two-room elementary school located three miles east of DeSoto. There were three types of trains that traveled past the school that were pulled by steam engines. There were the troop trains carrying new soldiers to the coast, munition trains transporting tanks and cannons, and with, there were trains with the white cross painted on the top and sides carrying the wounded to the hospitals. My first recollection of the war was a world map on my home taped to the wall with push pins stuck in it where the battles were being fought. We would listen to the updates on the radio and Dad would update the map. I remember listening to President Roosevelt's fireside chats on our battery-powered radio when I was a child. He addressed the fears and concerns of American people and informed them of the action the government was taking. These chats began in the 1930s by sharing information on the efforts to end the Great Depression and later provided encouragement during World War II. Our VFW post in DeSoto was named after two area soldiers who died in combat, Bill Linden and Charles Tripcoes. I knew Charles because my family and the Tri Tripcoes were longtime neighbors and friends. The William Tripco family lived on the adjoining farm and their two sons, James and Raymond, were in the Army. And I've, but I really, vividly recall a military rifle salute fired at Charles' funeral. During those days, if a family had a member serving in the military, a large blue star was placed in a window that could be viewed from the street. If a soldier was killed, the star was changed to a gold star. Our so when a soldier died in the war, a special way of honoring him was to name a newborn male after him. In DeSoto, for example, Merle Couch, who's now deceased himself, had an uncle, Merle, whose life was lost in the war. The phrase, he bought the farm, as I understand it, is that if a soldier was killed in action, his family would receive insurance issued by the government that might be enough to pay off the mortgage on the family farm. Letters from home were very important for the morale of the U.S. military men and women. Airmail letters were written on tissue paper to reduce the weight of the millions of letters sent to and from the United States. I remember sending homemade cookies to the Tripco brothers. They were packed in metal cans with a press-on lid, similar to a gallon-sized paint can, between layers of popped corn. This was before the invention of styrofoam peanuts. 
wartime recycling. Many items were limited supply for Americans when so much was needed for the war effort. Ration stamps were issued based on the size and special needs of American families. And some of the items rationed were automobile tires, gasoline, sugar, butter, and shoes. There was an active black market where one could buy extra rationed items if they were so inclined and had enough money. We were encouraged to grow larger vegetable gardens and were provided seed packets to plant victory gardens, which I learned we also did in World War I. I thought it started in World War II, but no, it was, it was before then. Artificial butter or margarine was first made without any yellow color. And later, it was shipped in a plastic bag with an orange pill inside that had to be kneaded to make it look more like margarine and, and, and look like real butter. Propaganda. Propaganda was used to vilify the enemy in political cartoons. The Japanese were simply Japs and pictured with large round black rimmed eyeglasses and large buck teeth. And, uh, and the Germans were called Krauts after sauerkraut or Jerry's. And when I was five or six, I had a shirt that had a frying pan pictured on it with three sunny side up eggs. The yolks of the eggs portrayed the faces of three German, three famous world leaders. Alfred, uh, Adolf Hitler from Germany, Tojo, and I can't pronounce his last name, from Japan, and Benito Mussolini from Italy. The title was Three Bad Eggs. <laughs> During this era, American photographers had small U.S. uniforms that young boys could wear when having their pictures taken. And I had one and I searched and searched for it and I cannot find it now. When it came to uh, let's see, reusing resources and manufacturing facilities, <coughs> during the war recycling was very important. People held newspaper drives, scrap iron was collected, household recycled cooking grease and cloth rags and old farm machinery, and even an old bridge over Cedar Creek was taken apart and sent to recycling. Manufacturing plants were converted when practical to make military items. Two examples are found to be surprising. One, Nellie Don, a high-end women's dress designer in Kansas City, switched to make military uniforms. And Radio Flyer, the children's wagon maker, started to make the famous rectangular fuel containers called jerry cans because they had the ability to press sheet metal into shapes with few seams. In the Fairfax Assembly Plant in Kansas City, they built or <coughs> assembled 6,608 B-25 bombers between 1941 and 1945. The planes had to be tested, and the sky over DeSoto would be occupied with dozens of planes flying in V formation like fox of, flocks of migrating geese bringing the sights and sounds of the war to life in American soil. The, those planes were piloted by women. Uh, you all heard about Rosie the Riveter. Well, there were a lot of jobs that were done by men. And, and uh, that's uh, another thing they did I'll, I'll touch on here later. But uh, uh, Harry Darby, a Kansas City politician and manufacturer, built 1,300 troop landing craft as well as larger ones that transported jeeps and tanks that were used for the D-Day landing on Omaha <coughs> Beach in Normandy, France on June the 6th, 1944. The landing craft had a retractable bow ramp that when lowered was like a castle drawbridge giving access to the beach for the men and machines. When completed, the, the landing craft were launched into the river and traveled down the Mississippi to New Orleans where they were put aboard ships that carried them from the Gulf of Mexico out and across the Atlantic Ocean. Darby even had a closer association with DeSoto in that his property supplied all the rock that was used for roads and concrete aggregates to build sunflower. Uh, let's see. Uh, he didn't, uh, he, he charged them so much a ton for each, uh, all the aggregates to build the roads and make the concrete out of it. Uh, sunflower ordnance work, sunflower ordnance works 
S O W. I thought that was some funny initials. That's, that's a mama pig. S O W. Uh, uh, but uh, then it was changed to the uh, uh, Army Ammunition Plant. Uh, let's see. Oh, that, the quarry, of course, is still operated today by Martin Marietta Company. But that's originally that was the Sunflower Ordnance Quarry where the rock came from. The Sunflower Ordnance Works plant was built southwest of DeSoto, and it was the world's largest producer of smokeless gunpowder and propellant for small arms, cannons, and rockets. It contained 10,000 acres. No, it doesn't. I don't know where I read that, but now it's 9,000, I don't know, 100 acres or something like that. Not at all. No, it went to the university. Yeah, okay. Uh, when the land was bought in 1942 by government land agents, they verbally informed landowners that they would be able to buy back their property after the U.S. won the war. But that never happened. Landowners were paid $30 an acre and given 30 days to vacate their land. Sub stone foundations and perennial flowers mark the former location of homes and, and farm buildings today. Uh, so, uh, uh, the reason, of course, it was um, the ordinance plant was been here as Benson before, it was because we were in the center of the United States, and as a consequence, it would be the least likely that an enemy forces could come in and bomb it. Uh, let's see. Uh, I also, uh, just recently heard that there was a, a slogan. Uh, the person who told me that is here. But, uh, I want to identify. But she said that this slogan was, quote, the Kansas sunflower will outshine the rising sun. The rising sun is, of course, the image on the Japanese flag. During the plant's construction, <laughs> approximately 24,000 people were employed in that construction. 24,000. Farm labor was as low as 25 cents an hour at that time, but sunflower workers earned a dollar or more. Many workers came from Arkansas and southern Missouri to be employed here, and it was said that many small towns ceased to exist due to, due to the fact that everyone uh, was leaving to work at Sunflower. The plant operated 24 hours a day, three-day hour shifts. All traffic from the east traveled through what is now downtown DeSoto, where the library, post office, and fire station are located. When the eight-hour shift change occurred, it was impossible to cross from one side of the street to the other. DeSoto's first stoplight was placed at what is now 83rd and Wheel Street to allow pedestrians to get across. And actually, I can't, I'm pretty sure about this, but I think the reason it was, light was put in because a young girl was struck and killed there. To get materials into and out of the plant, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers constructed a railroad from the Santa Fe main line through DeSoto, requiring one street bridge and two railroad bridges. All three still exist. There were 70 miles of railroad track inside the Sunflower plant. In 1943, a bypass was constructed to avoid traffic going through DeSoto Business District. It was just simply called the bypass to begin with, but now it's known as Lexington Avenue. The plant consumed great quantities of water. Some of that water came from wells on both sides of the Kansas River and continued to be operated by the city of DeSoto. There was a river intake that drew water directly from the river, even though it contained particles in suspension. It had less dissolved minerals, and that was used to generate steam to operate the machines without electrical spark that could cause explosions. Coal was used to generate the steam, and the storage yard was visible from Old K-10 Highway across from, from uh, the village. The filtration plant building that cleaned the water for steam, the steam plant still exists in great disrepair. The last time it was used in the 1990s to raise tilapia fish in it. <laughs> Many steps in reducing rocket propellant were very dangerous. The nitroglycerin was hauled in a two-wheeled cart with rubber tires pushed by one man. The carts were called angel buggies. The nitroglycerin was combined with cellulose and called nitrocotton. There were press houses where the material was compressed and rolled and to create solid fuel rocket. 
and they were referred to as carpet rolls. No buildings that could possibly catch fire and explode were outfitted with overhead water lines that could flood the buildings with thousands of gallons of water in a fraction of a second. The storage bunkers for the manufacturing propellant were on the south end of the plant and spaced a distance apart from each other. But in addition to being spaced apart, each one was surrounded by a high earthen berm, so that if it was to explode, the force of the blast would go upward instead of outward and not affect other adjacent buildings. Electricity was brought into the plant from Kansas City on double wooden poles that were regularly inspected by men known as highline walkers. When they were required to cross a stream, they had two cables in place. The bottom one was for the feet and the top one for their hands. The high line continues to exist today with the wooden poles replaced with steel poles, and you can see it where it crosses K-10, just west of Cedar Creek. With thousands of people employed at Sunflower Plant, there was an immediate shortage of human needs like housing. The government built Sun, Sunflower Village with its cinder block buildings with coal bands and lanes listed with letters of the alphabet and is now known as Clearview City. The new village was constructed out of wood and it was east of it and remains there. Only thing that remains is abandoned streets. The houses were moved all over the country the, the, uh, to mo and modified into more modern homes. The largest collection of them is in a subdivision in Soda known as Lakeview Heights. To accommodate an influx of people into the area, everything that could be modified into a place to sleep was rentable in, a, in DeSoto and the surrounding area. Our flood blame home, located north of 83rd Street and right off of Gardner Road, that's where all the sand plants are down there, it had more taverns, grocery stores, and sit-down restaurants during the time than it ever had before since. It probably had more drunkenness, fights, and gambling and other nefarious activities also. Uh, I recall, let's see, uh, I recall exactly what I did when I heard of President Roosevelt's death on April 12, 1945. I went to the field where our neighbor, Mr. Tripkos, was cultivating his potatoes and told him of the President's passing. I felt it was important for him to know this because his two sons were in the U.S. Army overseas. On September, the, let's see, on September 2, 1945, Japan formally surrendered to Allied powers aboard the U.S. Missouri and Tokyo Bay, ending World War II. The day was dubbed VJ Day, Victory Over Japan. My wife and I traveled with a group of tourists from Kansas City area to Hawaii in 1998. One of the most memorable places we visited, of course, was the battleship Arizona. I learned that the majority of the ships the Japanese sunk in Pearl Harbor on December the 7th, 1941, were refloated and used again against the Japanese during the war. As I stood there at the Arizona Memorial, I heard a loud, strange sound that I'd never heard before. And when I asked one of the sailors on duty to identify it, he informed me that it was the sound of the anchor chains running through the openings in the bow of the USS Missouri being moored over on Battleship Row, Fort Island, Pearl Harbor, almost a mile away. I find it appropriate that the USS Missouri is now in Pearl Harbor, where the war with Japan began, and placed as a memorial where the war ended. Thank you. Thank you. Carol Zimmerman. Don't forget your phone, honey. It's in the middle of the page. Okay. <laughs> I don't want to touch it. I don't like smartphones. <laughs> I'll take the mic. Me too. Come on up. <laughs> Thank you, Carol. Uh, David Bedford. I live over in DeSoto. Uh, when I went to work there, it was uh, 1985. I think I made it a whole week. <laughs> and then I found I had, I had to look up the word furlough and find out what a furlough was. So about six months later, they called me back up and said, you want, you want your job back? Well, I kind of questioned whether or not I even wanted to go back. 
since I only made it a week before I was laid off the first time. Um, I went into, I was working over in uh, Nitroguanabine, and I bumped around all over different buildings, and finally ended up, there was four shifts, and the shifts would all, we, we worked uh, seven days, off two, seven days off two, seven days off three, and you rotated backwards. And so when you were doing that, you'd go from, like if you got off at midnight on your evening shift, your two days off, you had to come back in on days because you rotated backwards against clock. Um, I worked in production for about four years. During that time, um, we had an operator that um, I was out eating lunch. I was the A operator in 9040 Wet Guadalupe Nitrate. And the operator come in and I had a line that was stopped up and typically we use steam to uh, open up the lines. And he threw the uh, nitric acid to uh, manual and he spun the valve the wrong way and so he opened it up so it was dumping nitric acid in as fast as he could. <laughs> and then went downstairs, hooked the steam line up, and started steaming the line out. Well, water and nitric acid doesn't mix very well. So when it took uh, about a 10-foot diameter stainless steel tank and blew the lid off of it and blew it through the roof, it was uh, probably, you were probably there investigating during that time. Um, Later on, I ended up switching, and I went to uh, roads and grounds because having a family and stuff like that made it real difficult because my two days off, one of those days I was sleeping, trying to get my schedule turned back around because you couldn't just stay up late, you know, because if you stayed up late, you just burnt your, one of your days. So you had to go home and go to bed directly as soon as you got home because and force yourself to get up early on the next two days. I was like a walking zombie for about two years, I think, because it just rotating and rotating and rotating. And Kenny probably remembers it very well, I'm sure, Johnson. <laughs> but uh, there was, uh, I ended up switching and going over to Roads and Grounds. And after I went to Roads and Grounds, Met a lot of really nice people. Around, you know, I recognized quite a few of you in the room. That um, because we covered the 10,000 plus acres, and we'd get a call to say go over to Roberts Lake. Somebody's got a deer stand up. So we'd go over there and we'd go jump over the fence and we'd take the deer stand down, take it back up, give it security. We walked the whole perimeter more than once. <clears throat> did work on P3, P4 bridges, uh, worked on all the water intake down at the river, and worked on all the wells. And it was, uh, it was a good experience because, you know, we had a lot, had to cover so much of it that we were moving all the time. And then snow removal and plus mowing and trimming and stuff like that. Probably one of the funnest things we did was racing up the water towers. <laughs> because uh, the, the, four, the water tower is right there in the front, we had to do an inspection. We had to go up the water tower and we had to inspect and look for broken welds, get inside of them, they'd drain one of them out and we'd get inside of it and inspect it. But uh, we'd literally, we'd line up four guys and we'd, at the bottom and we'd take off and we'd run up the water tower and race to see who could get up to the top fastest. And, but it was it was good. The whole thing was good. I uh, left there and after eight years, been about 94, um, went to work for uh, Bird Environmental there at North Acid and uh, <coughs> proved out the wastewater treatment plant that they put in there where they were uh, treating out the sludge and stuff like that. And then uh, went from there to further my career uh, elsewhere.
He went someplace I didn't go. I've never been in the water. Yeah, please come on. I've been every place else. It's scary when you go in there and the ladder is broke free. <laughs> Accidentally, of course. <laughs> Thank you for doing this. This is simple. Yeah. Happy to do it. Hello, I'm Dean Stark. I'll give you a little bit of a different perspective, probably. I'm an old sunflower rat. My dad helped build it, so I moved there in 1943. I lived there, went to high school, got out of your door in 1958, went to the Marine Corps a little bit, came home, went to work at Sunflower in 1966, worked there until 1995. So I was there 29 straight years. I worked there when there was several thousand, and I worked there when there was only a hundred. I was an outside lineman. I had absolutely nothing to do with making powder. Those electric lines that came in, we kept them going. We kept electricity to all the buildings, and we went all over the plant. So I've been every single place there was in the plant. And I'll tell you, there are some of the best people in the world that ever worked there. I've gone to California, New Jersey, all over the world, and you'll see somebody who worked at Sunflower sometime or other. It's amazing how many people were there. I don't know. I've, I got a lot of stories. A lot of them we couldn't tell. They're not legal. <laughs> I think the longest work there one time was we had a little tornado come through. Of course, it took down a bunch of electric poles. So we was working. Regular, my regular shift was eight to four, and then called in any time. We worked eight to four. I went home. Got a call, went back to work at six o'clock that evening. I was gone home two hours. Worked all night, all the next day. They gave us a two hour nap, and sent us up to the hospital a couple hours during the day, sent us home, we came back and worked the next day, 12 hours to get all the power lines back up. So I was just a lineman like you see out KPNL or whatever. But it was interesting and it was the best place in the world. I enjoyed every single day I worked there all 29 years. That's about it. Who's next? Please come up. Thank you. My name is Gayla Frazier. I worked at the plant for a total of 34 years, and anybody who worked there more than one time or will tell you that they worked there a total of so many years. So I worked there from 1965 until 1973 during the Vietnam conflict, and then I was laid off during the standby, and I was gone for two years, and I came back to work and worked until 2001 when the plant closed. And then um, since I worked in the administrative areas, I worked for another year after that helping close the contracts. But something that was said by the last couple of speakers, I wanna emphasize. I think what made Sunflower special, not only the fact that it was a, a special place, it was like a small city, but there were many other Army ammunition plants around the, the country. But ours was special. It was the people, the Midwestern people. We made it run. And it just took a lot of effort, a lot of people caring about what went on there and doing things right. And I just, I loved working there most of the time. And uh, I think anybody who worked there any length of time can tell you how much they love the people. So that's, that's basically it. Rex? I forgot to mention that you were plant manager. Oh, uh, for the last five years. Yeah, I started, okay, I'll, I will tell you briefly. My grandfather and uncles helped build the plant. My father started working at the plant in 1951. Some of you may... Remember Eldon Lovelett? Margie. 
He was the fire chief when he retired. He lived here in Eudora for many years. And he was a wonderful guy. <laughs> I may be a little prejudiced, but I, I'm not too much, I think. Um, and then I worked at a lot of different administrative jobs, including handling government funding, which was maybe one of the low po points of working there, learning how the government handles our money. <laughs> but we took a lot of pride in trying to do the right thing. And, um, and so, uh, yeah, I, I was a plant manager the last five years and um, couldn't have done it with all the great people. Great people worked there. Please come up. Is it coffee regular that maybe more people show up? Hi, I'm Eddie Breed from Eudora, and I worked out there from 66 to 73, and uh, probably a lot of you out there know me. If you worked in the garage, you know where the garage was, and um, I was the one that pumped your gas and all the vehicles out there for quite a few years. Me and uh, Leonard Greider worked with Leonard for a long time. Me and him pumped the gas, and I never did work down on F line or anything like that. But it was a wonderful job out there. And then they closed up in '73 or four. They was getting ready to go in making that nitroguanidine or something later on. And of course I went to farmland, worked there 30 years. So, but uh, yeah, it was interesting working out there. It was a really good job. And I've noticed a lot of faces I haven't seen for quite a while, getting older. <laughs> but that's about all I have to say. Thank you. I want to donate to the society. It's a Hercules uh -huh. Frisbee 75th anniversary. Thank you. I don't think we have one of those. No. <laughs> and this is a picture of Potter's Lake. This is the uh, officer's quarters. And that's where they went to for rest and relaxation. There was fish in this pond. And uh, I bought this at a garage sale a couple of years ago. Mm. And now it's yours. <laughs> well, thank you, Rex. <clears throat> now, my family's got quite a history with Hercules. My mother worked in inhibiting and on inline, and that's where they, on the Mighty Mouse rockets, where they pasted the ends on the rolls that she was describing a while ago. And uh, my father, he was a union pipe fitter. And my first summer out of high school in 1968, he hired me to uh, help renovate the laundromat out there. So we had a, an apprentice and myself and my dad we worked all summer and we replaced all the washing machines and all the dryers. And we had another small job down on F line where we put in a sewer line. And my, and my sister, my youngest sister Brenda, she was a union pipe fitter as well. And she helped build the uh, sunflower plant with a uh, napkin. And that's who my father worked for also. You know, some of the people from Eudora that have passed on that, that I worked with out there and the names you might remember. Doobie Treffs, Dick Brown, Ken Snow, Terry Fry, Ed Shawbaker, Sue Mosu, John Reeves, Russ Lawson. And those are some of the people from Eudora that worked out there and have passed on. I worked out there 20 years, 15 for Hercules. And um, my first day on the job out there, we were doing a demo. I worked in roads and grounds. And we were tearing down the uh, nitroglondine building up by the entrance to the plant, the first one. And those guys showed me what nitro cotton did. It was stuck in the walls of these bricks. They took a hammer and they hit it, and the spark ran up to the 
up the, all the way up the wall. And I said, whoa, I don't know if I want any part of this job. <laughs> and so while we were tearing out the walls, I came across a little bottle in the wall. It was inside the wall. And it was Myers Dairy. And it said, on the home front, on the war front. And so I kept that. I've got that. I'm going to donate that to the society. And uh, I worked uh, four years for a Melco Electric and one year for Santa Fe Engineers in the Mech Road uh, renovation down in the new part down in the plant, south of the acid plant. And uh, I worked two summers out there, as this one person described her summer job. I worked in nitrocellulose, and those were the first the four-story brick buildings as you come in the plant on the right, there was a line of about four or five of them. And they took cotton balls, and you raked them down out of the copper bin, which came from across the warehouse over there, where they fluffed up these big cotton bales that were like eight foot long and weighed about 200 pounds. And they'd cut the string on them and run them through this dehydrator to get them dry. They'd run them up the tube into the other building, and you'd pull on that, and put them in barrels, and they had these slides along the floor, and you'd slide the barrel. You had to grease the slides all the time, and you take the the uh, cotton up to the t up to the tubs. You'd open the lid, you'd fork the cotton in with a pitchfork, and then they'd add the nitric acid, and then the fun began because I was in the in that building when that tornado hit in 1969 that someone mentioned. I was up on the third floor. And all the doors were on the west side, facing towards Eudora. And uh, I opened the door and looked out and saw this black cloud rolling right on the top of the ground, coming straight for us. Well, we couldn't get the doors open after that. The windows started busting out. The electricity went off. And the acid fumes started to fill the whole building. It turned my safety glasses yellow from the tint of the acid. You couldn't breathe. I had a handkerchief. We all went back in the cotton bin because the building was moving three foot east and west, east and west. And I thought for sure that building was going to collapse, but it never did. And uh, like, the, like Gayla said, it was a family. We had a softball league out there where we played softball on the field out there. And then we had volleyball teams where we played a volleyball league out there too. And one thing that was really unique about Sunflower is the wildlife. I saw coyotes, we saw turkeys, rattlesnakes, and bobcats, and geese and ducks. Anything you can imagine. I saw a corn snake in the road out there that was five foot long. And I, I, I heard a story where some electrician got trapped in a building and there was, a, a, was going up on one of these old buildings and he came across a bobcat that was in that room and that bobcat ran between his legs and out that door. <laughs> uh, I worked in 510 Warehouse, and uh, Gayla was my boss's boss. So I worked as a truck driver. I also operated the fuel truck and the filling station, as Eddie did. I operated the forklift. Uh, I was a switchman, and I also operated the locomotive. They only had 14 locomotive operators in the history of Hercules. And I was number 13, but my boss, Terry Fry, he skipped it and gave me number 14. <laughs> I'm going to donate that to you, too. <laughs> also was a fire marshal on some of the 60 or 70 warehouses and cylinder houses we had all through the plant. The California Trail passes through the Sunflower plant. And uh, when I was president of this historical society back in the late 90s and early 2000s, of course, they were talking about the Land of Oz building an amusement park out there. Well, I was also a member of the Eudora City Council, and I went to all those hearings in DeSoto and spoke at all those hearings and mentioned the wildlife and the, the California trails out there. Once it's paved over, it can never be recovered. And so that was that figured into their decision. I know it did uh, when I described the importance of the plant and what it meant to people in DeSoto and Eudora. Ottawa and Tonganoxie and I mean they came from all over and I met a lot of great friends and of course I've lost contact with a lot of them but uh, I'll never forget them it was a great it was the best job I had in my life 
I had to leave for work at 7.30 in the morning. I also drove the buses too, like somebody else did. Uh, we had to be there by a quarter till and we'd drive down into the shop area and then we'd leave, we'd be back up at the gate by four o'clock. So we got paid for our lunch hour, or 20 minutes, but we had to get up and unload trucks if a truck came into the dock in the warehouse. But it was a great job and I, I loved every minute. By the way, I've got to mention one thing. Benny Dean was a fireman out there. And Benny Dean is one of the, well, along with Bill Gordon, helped renovate the historical museum downtown. And I think they deserve a hand for that. That's great. <laughs> and you know, this is the biggest crowd I've ever seen at a historical society meeting easily. Back when I was president, we'd be lucky to have 30 or 35 until we started having ice cream and cookies. <laughs> <laughs> and Fern didn't like that. <laughs> it was in the Constitution not to have refreshments at meetings, but I, when, I, when our meeting, when our membership doubled, I think she understood. <laughs> and that's about all I've got. Any questions? Rex Burkhart. I'm a, I've lived, I lived in Sunflower Village from 50 to 53, and then we moved to Eudora. And I live in the house that my dad built at 934 Pine. I think we got John coming real quick. Oh, yeah. No, sir. This, this is a fourth man. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening. My name is Chuck Jarrett. I uh, started out working at Sunflower in the summer of 1965. Me and uh, Hank Booth, a fellow named Cole, who has a glass pharmacy in, uh, I mean, an eyeglass pharmacy in Lawrence. And uh, I can't remember the other guy, but we were all headed for college the next fall. And we worked out at uh, the plant that summer, and they gave us uh, a large sigh, and they took us out to the barricades. And what we did, we cut weeds off of those barricades to keep the soil from eroding. And that was my beginning at Sunflower. Uh, I went to, uh, well, I went to school, then I came, came back to work another summer out there, and during the summer I got married. Well, after that, I said, well, there's no more going back to school for me. I had to support my family. So I stayed on at Sunflower. They, they wanted to know, well, they kept on asking me, well, when are you going to go back to school? I said, I can't go back to school. I need to work. And they're making good money, you know, like everybody said. And I was, I was fortunate enough to stay. Uh, I worked in roads and grounds. I worked uh, with the pipe fitters. I worked with the carpenters. I worked uh, with the painters. I was a handyman with the planers. I helped uh, work all over the plant at one time or another. But uh, where I ended up was in the powerhouse. And during, during my time in the powerhouse, I worked as a, boiler, a coal handler, uh, C operator, B operator, and relief A operator. And while I was working at the powerhouse, which is about eight or nine years I was there, uh, this powerhouse number three, we had three boilers. And uh, as we, uh, one night we was working, uh, and I looked over to the east of the powerhouse. The powerhouse was a pretty tall building. You could see all over. I looked over there and one of the blenders had blown up. I never saw anything like that in my life, 
but we, uh, I could witness that from where I was at. Uh, I worked at uh, the firehouse until, well, let me see, I started 65. It must have been around 70-something when it shut down. Uh, they had a layoff, furlough, as some people <laughs> call it. <laughs> well, uh, and, and they, uh, I thought I was going to be laid off from the plant. And they, uh, matter of fact, I had a job at co-op. I'd uh, signed up as a boiler operator in co-op. But what happened was they wanted to move me from the powerhouse. They had an open position at the fire department. So I was a fire department person for about, I don't know, nine years. I was a fireman, relief pump operator, relief crew chief. Uh, when I left the fire department. And about that time, nitroguanine was coming into play. And they had a big uh, meal. Sometimes, you know, you have, you remember those big meals they used to have, those people that worked out there at that time? And they were celebrating the beginning of the nitroguanine facility. And what they were looking for was somebody that could uh, communicate to the people at that time. Now, I, I promise you, I'm not going to take up too much more of your time, but uh, I, I didn't plan on doing this. But uh, uh, they had a speech contest. And at that time, I was pretty fluent with words, <laughs> let's put it that way. And I was, I gave a speech, a safety speech, and they liked it. The managers from uh, Utah was where our headquarters was at that particular time, came down and they liked what I said. And they, uh, I was offered a position in the safety department. I was really surprised at that, at that time, but I worked with a gentleman named Bill Riffle. Uh, let's see, who was the manager at that time? I think Bob Shepard was the manager, the manager at that time. And uh, I, I got in with the safety department. They sent me all over the country to different schools and so forth to learn the trade, and I was really grateful for that. One of the things that I, and I've heard several people mention this, one of the things about Sunflower, and being at a, pardon me for leaving my, I got a bad back. Uh, one of the things about the plant is the people. And it takes a group of good people to do what we did at Sunflower, making powder and not getting hurt and not hurting anybody else. It was, it was a very sensitive job when you're working with nitric cotton, nitroglycerin, and nitroguanidine, they were very flammable products if you didn't treat them right. And a lot of people, uh, we were very fortunate to have some guidelines from the aerospace production, pro uh, aer aerospace propulsion uh, standards that were written in blood, really, uh, that kept us straight. And if you didn't follow those rules, you would be in trouble. <clears throat> One of the things that I wanted to make sure that I did in the position I was in was, okay, when you leave home to go to work, the job is not completed until that individual returns home. That's when the job is completed, when they go get back with their family. And I tried to enforce that 
to every soul that had an ear that would listen to me. That's the most important part of the job, was to get back home to your family. Uh, a lot of good people. I worked with a lot of good people out there. Uh, and I don't know how many of them is here or not. How many, how many actually worked, worked there? Worked or was there? <laughs> uh, there was there was a lot of good people who worked out there. They taught me a lot, and I ta I tried to inform them of a lot of things and keep them out of trouble. Uh, one experience I remember is uh, uh, as late in the evening I stayed over from work. And uh, there's a gentleman that was, had to go into one of the uh, wells down uh, on the, in the plant. It was uh, a sewer, really a sewer lift station. And he had to go down in there to uh, do some work to remove a, a pump or something. And they said, well, let's, Let's go down in here. I said, wait a minute. We need to get a harness and a rope and tie this man off because if that sewer, if that pump, sewer pump line lets loose some water while he's down there, we'll lose him. And we stopped, we checked the air, made sure the air was safe for him to go down there, and we made sure he had that harness on. What so happened while he was down there, yeah, lift station let some water out, and fortunately we had that harness on him and we brought him back out. That was my job. That was one of the situations. There's probably a few others I can mention, but I enjoyed working there. It was a good experience for me. I'll never forget it, and a lot of it still stays with me. And I thank you for, you got any uh, questions? Anybody have any questions? Yes. Jeff, do you remember the time it was in the spring of 1980, and I was pregnant with Julie, and we had uh, a couple of people from Topeka come in and were buy those big tanks. Right. So they could do ethanol. And you had gone down to give them safety talk about cutting off the bolts and the water, and you came back to the hospital because they were in the hospital with us and we had a big explosion. Yeah. We lost one of the guys died that day. That day. But I remember that. What, what, I had several duties in the position I was in. One Jim talked about was re reviewing drawings uh, to approve before they went to you for final approval. Uh, I did contractor instruction on uh, any subcontractor that came on to the plant that did any work, I helped in, in explain to them the buildings we were working with. Rex was talking about cotton in the walls, is in the floors, so forth, and some of, some of the buildings out there. If you didn't know what to do, if you didn't wet it down before you tried to cut it or do anything like that, it would light off. The shirt that Jim was talking about where we had that explosion, that was nitric cotton in a pipe that was about 30 feet off the floor. There was valves and the cotton was caught in the pipe. When, that, when we let that fire off to burn that building to decontaminate it, that pipe went off, and it was compressed, and that's what happened. We had that explosion. Uh, we were very fortunate. We got, uh, when we did the white paper to uh, determine how we were going to do the demolition of the plant, it was very involved. It had to explain how we were going to attack things. We had to check the weather, check the wind, 
Uh, Bert Volkers uh, was the uh, manager at that time in the, in the uh, maintenance area. We had to make sure that when we burn a building, that the smoke didn't contaminate any of the buildings around the plant. We, uh, it, was, it was a very involved situation. I worked with hazard analysis to make sure we had the boundaries, that if anything went off, we, uh, we didn't hurt anybody. And if there's, if there's scrap, no, it would not go far enough to, to hit anyone. It was, it was all an involved procedure. It was a, a very unique situation. Uh, any other questions? Didn't the majority of the buildings out there have asbestos inside? Oh, <laughs> my goodness. <laughs> when we did the demolition, when we started the demolition of the buildings, all the buildings had these, these uh, they used to put them on all, all, a lot of buildings, even, even in the, they had these shingles that were made out of asbestos to keep things from burning. Uh, the piping had asbestos uh, packed around it to, uh, to uh, protect the, the piping from uh, getting hot. Uh, to remove that stuff, you had to dress up. Donna was our industrial hygienist. She did sampling of the air to make sure we did not expose the workers to high levels of asbestos. Had mask on, it was, it was a terrible job. Uh, I, I got dressed up, I, I wanted to see what it was like to be in those uniforms because you had to be covered from head to toe. And it was uncomfortable. And it was hard work. But we got, we got through it. <coughs> Somehow, Jim was talking about uh, those workers were absolutely wonderful. They were. They, and I, I, it, and it I was, went out and inspected every single building after they took the asbestos out with them there with me, and that was just a delightful experience to make sure that they had done everything to it, it was, everybody, it, and they did an outstanding job. Had to, had to, they had to, to protect themselves. Also, Jim was talking about going through the buildings and, and putting his initials on equipment. <laughs> well, I went through, I don't know if it's before or after you, <laughs> but I went through and marked them with temperature paint to make sure that the equipment got sufficient heat that when the subcontractors came in to tear those pieces of equipment and presses and stuff apart that we did not have an incident from them doing that. And everybody, every, every one of them buildings that we uh, got rid of, I was in them. <laughs> I was in them also, Jim. Uh, that's all I have to say. I do have I do have a layout of the map here. I've got uh, uh, some of, some, well, here, I came to the plant when J.B. Talley was the uh, uh, manager. J.O. Mack, Kim Crowfall, uh, Richardson, Tom Newsom, after Tom Newsom, there was a young man, Jim, I can't remember his name. Wait, wait, what? Jim Woolwine. Uh, there was a young man before him. Oh, John Schrader. John Schrader, okay. Uh, but this, this, this gentleman in the middle here, his name was Moorhead, and he was Jim's boss, I believe. Yes, Mr. Moorhead was the head of the... And he was there when all these uh, Hercules employees or managers were there. And I, I got that. 
I don't know if you got one of these or not, Jim, but uh, I I have a bunch of stuff. photographs. <laughs> if it if it had me in it, they gave me a copy of it. <laughs> okay. Did you need your pen? I want to thank everyone. We unfortunately have to be out of here at 9 o'clock because the city is nice enough to let us use this building for free, but their employee gets off at 9 o'clock and I don't want to have to make them stay later than they, than they want to. What I will say is that if you didn't have a chance to come up here and speak, please contact me. My name is Ben Terwilliger. My email address is eudorahistory at gmail.com. And if you come uh, to the museum sometime, we'll record you and we'll be able to have you say some stories.